Welcome to this edition of Theological Journals, Fundamentals in the Faith, Volume 1, Chapter 4, The Bible and Modern Criticism, by F. Betex, Professor Emeritus of Stuttgart, Germany, translated from the original German by David Hegel. It is undeniable that the universe, including ourselves, exists when comes it all, comes it all. For any clear thinking mind, there's only three possibilities. It exists, the universe has always existed, it produced itself, or it was created by a divine supreme being. The universe, not eternal. The eternity of the universe is most clearly disproved by its evolution. From a scientific point of view, that hypothesis is now discredited and virtually abandoned. Astronomers, physicists, biologists, philosophers are beginning to recognize more and more. Men like C.G. Du Bois Raymond, Lord Kelvin, Dr. Klein, and others unanimously affirm that creation had a beginning. It always tends towards entropy, that is, toward a perfect equilibrium of its forces, a complete standstill. And the fact that it has not reached such a condition is proof that it has not always existed. Should creation, however, ever come to a standstill, it could never again put itself in motion. It has had a beginning and it will have an end. That is demonstrated most clearly by the still unfinished evolution. Should anyone say to us of a growing tree or a young child that either of these forms has existed forever, we would at once reply, why has it been not long ago in past eternity grown up so as to reach the heaven of heavens? In like manner reasons that great astronomer William Herschel with regard to the Milky Way, that just its breaking up into different parts shows that it cannot always endure, so we have. In the same fact, proof that it has not eternally existed. There remains therefore only the alternative, either the world produced itself or it was created that all things came into existence spontaneously, and therefore that it, we must suppose an origination of immeasurably great effects without any cause, or believe that at some time a nothing, without either willing or knowing it, and without use of means became a something. That is the most unreasonable assumption that could possibly be attributed to a human being. How could anything act before it existed? Or a thing not yet created produce something? There is nothing more unreasonable than the creed of the unbeliever, not with, uh, notwithstanding all his prating about the excellence of reason. We'll turn to volume two of Fundamentals in the Faith, article by Dr. Whitelaw. Take that back, it's Dr. James Gray on inspiration. We quote here a paragraph or two from Dr. Daniel, Nathaniel West. He's referring to 2 Timothy 3.16, which he renders Every scripture is inspired of God and adds. The distributive word every is used not only to particularize each individual scripture of the canon that Timothy had studied from youth, but also to include along with the Old Testament, the New Testament scriptures extant in Paul's day and any others such as those that John wrote after him. The Apostle Peter tells us that he was in possession not merely of some of Paul's epistles, but all his epistles, and places them canonically in the same rank with what he calls the other scriptures of equal inspiration and authority with the words spoken before the holy prophets. 
Paul teaches the same coordination of the Old and New Testaments, having referred to the Old as a unit in his phrase, Holy Scriptures, which the revisers translate sacred writings. He proceeds to particularize. He tells Timothy that every scripture, whether of Old or New Testament production, is inspired of God. That would be the Pentateuch, the Psalms, the prophets, the historical books. Let it be chapter or verse. Let it be in the Gospels, the Acts, his own or Peter's epistles, or even John's writings yet to be still each part of the sacred collection is given, God-given, and because of that possesses divine authority as part of the book of God. We read this from Dr. West 20 years ago and rejected it as his dictum. We read it today with deeper and fuller knowledge of the subject, and we believe it to be true. It is somewhat as follows that Dr. Gosson, in his exhaustive Feltnustia, gives the argument for the inspiration of the New Testament. Turn to Fundamentals, Doctrines in the Faith, Chapter 2, Paul's Testimony to the Doctrine of Sin, by Professor Charles B. Williams, Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, Fort Worth. Theodore Parker once said, I seldom use the word sin. Christian doctrine of sin is the devil's own. I hate it utterly. His view of sin shaped his views as to the person of Christ, atonement, and salvation. In fact, the question is back of one's theology, soteriology, sociology, evangelism and ethics. One cannot hold a scriptural view of God and the plan of salvation without having a scriptural idea of sin. One cannot proclaim a true theory of society unless he sees the heinousness of sin and its relation to all social ills and disorders. No man can be a successful New Testament evangelist publishing the gospel as the power of God unto salvation to all who believe, unless he has an adequate conception of the enormity of sin. Nor can a man hold a consistent theory of ethics or live up to the highest standards of morality unless he is gripped with a keen sense of sin's seductive nature. Sin, a fact in human history. Paul has an extensive vocabulary of terms denoting sin or sins. In the epistle to the Romans, where he elaborates his doctrine of sin, he uses ten general terms for sin. We'll review the first three. Hamaria, hamartia, 58 times in all, 43 in Romans, missing of the mark, sin as a principle. Amartema, twice, sin as an act. Parab Parabasis, five times, transgression. Literally walking along the line, but not exactly according to it. We'll pick up the remaining terms in our next edition. <clears throat> now for attorney Philip Morrow on the vanity of philosophy. The effect upon plastic minds of undergraduates of such words as those last quoted can easily be imagined. They artfully convey the suggestion that these young men are, in respect of philosophical notions, vastly superior to the men of light and learning of past generations. And that it is the repudiation of Christianity and its lively oracles that they furnish convincing proof of their intellectual superiority. There are few minds among men of the age here addressed, or of any age, except they be firmly grounded and established in the truth. 
which could resist the insidious influence of such an influence to the innate vanity of man. Such being then the influences to which students at our universities are now exposed, is there not an urgent need of impressing upon Christian parents there are yet few, a few remaining? The warning of our text and exhorting them to beware lest their children be despoiled through philosophy and vain deceit. A great peril. What does this sudden and stupendous change portend? Is not the very existence of Christianized civilization, the social system which has been reared under the influence and protection of Christianity, imperiled by it? Beyond all doubt, it is. Nor is our reasonable apprehension in this regard in any way allayed by Professor James's statements that the principal factors of this change are scientific evolutionism and the rising tide of social democratic ideals. Great is the mischief already accomplished by these mighty agencies of evil. And we are as of yet but at the beginning of their destructive career. And we turn now from that to theologians you should know with Dr. Michael Reeves. We're talking about Athanasius. Athanasius was born somewhere around 296 AD. And after that, we know virtually nothing about his youth or appearance. Admirers said he had angelic good looks. Opponents called him a black dwarf due to his diminutive stature. The one physical trait we can be sure of. At quite a young age, though, he seems to have been a talent spotted, been talent spotted by Alexander, the bishop of the bustling metropolis of Alexandria in Egypt who provided him with a first-rate theological education. During his early years, the young Athanasius would also have seen sweeping through the city some of the most intense waves of persecution that the Roman imperial authorities had ever mustered, killing off many of the prominent Christians of the generation above him. Then in 318, Arius, a presbyter of the church in Alexandria, began to accuse Alexander of failing to distinguish properly between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Instead, Arius began teaching that the Son was actually a created being made by the Father to go on and create the universe. A brilliant propagandist, Arius put his theology into ditties, set them to well-known tunes, and quickly whipped up popular support for his views. Mobs were soon marching through the city, chanting the slogans of Arius's theology. Alexander responded by gathering just over a hundred bishops to Alexandria to examine Arius's view. They quickly condemned the new teaching as heresy, removed Arius as a presbyter, and forced him to leave the city. Far from putting a lid on the problem, that just spread it. Arius fled to Nicomedia near modern Istanbul, where the bishop Eusebius was supportive. Out of foot, a few footnotes. <clears throat> Arius had received his theological training in Antioch and so approached theology from a rather different angle than the theologians of Alexandria. <clears throat> Singing their theology remained an effective Arian tactic for many years. Arian choirs used to sing through the nights in the streets of Constantinople until the bishop, John Chrysostom, set against them choirs singing Orthodox hymns, a showdown that somewhat inevitably ended up with rival choirs in a street battle. 
after which the practice was made illegal for the Arians. Eusebius of Nicomedia should not be confused with his contemporary Eusebius of Caesarea, the great church historian. So he flees to Nicomedia. Eusebius used his powerful influence to help wage a campaign to win over any bishops who had not condemned Arius at Alexandria. Not long after, Constantine, who had been a Christian and emperor of the western half of the Roman Empire for little over a decade, added the eastern half to his domain, perhaps because he saw Christianity as a potential force for unity. The next year, 325, he invited bishops from across the empire and some from without to a general council at Nicaea, also near Istanbul, to resolve the matter of Arius's teaching. Some 300 bishops came, including Alexander of Alexandria with his young secretary, Athanasius. How the bishops must have pinched themselves in wonder. Just a few years earlier, the Roman emperor had been the instigator of persecution, and some of the bishops themselves had been mutilated and scarred in the days of trial. And here they were discussing theology in front of the emperor and being feasted by him. We turn now to Princeton Theological Review of 2007 variegated metaphorical approach of Calvin to the atonement. In the Institutes, Calvin writes, clothed in our flesh, he conquered death with sin, that the victory of triumph might be ours, that he offered in sacrifice the flesh which he took from us, that by expiation wrought he might destroy our guilt and might appease the Father's just anger. Here Calvin uses three distinct linguistic categories in reference to the atonement in a single statement. Victory over the powers of evil, sacrificial appeasement of the divine wrath, and substitutionary expiation of human guilt. Calvin never formulated a systematic doctrine of the atonement Instead, his view of the work of Christ, which is too multifaceted and too organizationally indistinct to be called a theory, is scattered throughout his published works. Rather than existing as a discrete section of the Institutes, Calvin's view on the atonement flavors everything he has to say. It is wrapped up in the person and work of Jesus Christ was the subject of the entire theological endeavor. What then is the problem that the atonement must resolve? The starting point is human sin. Sin must be dealt with, which means in part that the curse must be lifted, the punishment must be exacted, the human revolt must end, and God and human beings must be reunited. For our part, The wrath of God towards us must be satisfied. For God's part, our sin must be expiated and we must be brought back into a state of obedience, which we are helpless to do. Before considering five major categories under which Calvin described the atonement, it should be noted that Calvin's theology is bound to the complex chorus of Scripture. Trevor Hart, Humankind in Christ and Christ in Humankind. Salvation as participation in our substitute in the theology of John Craw, Calvin. Scottish Theological Journal, 1989. And the fact that many later Calvinists, including John Owen, broke from Calvin and went beyond the limits of Scripture. C. Kennedy. It is informed by a careful reading of scripture and derivatively the Apostles' Creed, which forms the structure of Book 2 
chapter 16 of the Institutes and never done in abstract isolation. The fact is vital in recognizing the source of the variegated approach to the atonement, since his source material is equally variegated. I take it for granted that the biblical authors employ a variety of categories for describing the work of the atonement, work of Christ, including but not limited to ransom, Mark 10, 45, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, victory, Matthew 4, 1 to 11, Revelation 17, 14, blood sacrifice, Mark 14, 24, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, penal substitution, Romans 4, 23 to 25, Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, recapitulation, Romans 5, 12 to 21, exemplar, 1 Peter 2, 21 to 25, 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, and interpersonal reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 20, Romans 5, 10. And authors such as Paul, like Calvin, will invoke multiple metaphors even within the same passage. A separate study of the use of the many atonement metaphors throughout scripture would be helpful. The fact is vital in recognizing the source of his variegated approach to atonement, since the source material is equally variegated. Bruce McCormick suggests that a function of this commitment to the authority of scripture was Calvin's anti-speculative tendency, which is why he never set forth a comprehensive Christology or atonement doctrine. In proportion with scripture, some atonement concepts are more prominent than others in Calvin. The Levitical code outlining the sacrificial system is prominent in the history of Israel and provides an indispensable model for the New Testament author's description of who Jesus is and why he died in the way he did. It is no surprise then that for Calvin, this is a key atonement model. The theme of cultic sacrifice is interlaced with other of Calvin's two dominant atonement motifs forensic or judicial satisfaction. These two models dominate the landscape of Calvin's atonement theology. We will consider them along with three others. Very good so far. Reform Faith and Practice 2022, pages 32 to 56 with Dr. J. Fesco's evaluation of Voss and Warfield on Romans 1, 3, and 4. Instead, Webster rightly counters scripture must be the terminus ad quem of systematic theological analysis, not its terminus a quo. In other words, scripture is both the starting point and goal for systematic theology or systematic theology is both ontological and redemptive historical. Conversely, biblical theology is both historical and systematic theological. We should not choose between Warfield or Voss, but need both. The eternal Son of God enters the world and is inaugurated as the mediator in redemptive history. While one may use Voss's circle versus line analogy to distinguish the systematic from the redemptive historical, we must not press the analogy too far. We wonder if part of the reason why Voss and Warfield did not see eye to eye on Romans 1 to 3 to 4 is that they were looking at Paul's text refracted through the lens of the recently created discipline of biblical versus systematic theology and thus press their interpretations to different ends. 
to avoid this false dilemma, we must recognize that Scripture is doing the theological work and not merely providing raw data to construct proofs for doctrines in non-scriptural idiom. Rather, the same word who was with God and was God is also the same word who became flesh in the midst of history and tabernacled among us. Conclusion Placing Voss within the wider and narrower context of the history of interpretation in Princeton Seminary provides the background to assess properly the evolution of his exegesis of Romans 1, 3, and 4. Voss was not the first exegete to highlight the redemptive historical aspects of Paul's text, as Luther was arguably one of the first and who also informed the German scholars that Voss consulted. At the same time, one need not choose between an ontological versus biblical theological reading of Romans 1, 3 through 4 based on two factors, the significance of Paul's terms, Christ is the Son of God and Son of David, history of exegesis. Got a footnote here. Gaffin readily accepts the two natures of Christ, but insists this is not in view in Paul's statement. Quote, a proper interpretation of these verses must appreciate the centrality of the temporal factor minimized by Gaffin. Gaffin believes that the horizontal is central and the ontological present, but in the background. And so Gaffin presses his point. Romans 1, 3, and 4 do not contrast two coexisting aspects, the two divine natures and the makeup of Christ's person. The insuperable obstacles for this view are the ionic nature of the Numa Sark's antithesis and the economic rather than purely ontological characterization of the designation Son of God. Instead, the contrast is between two successive phases in Christ's history, implying two successive modes of incarnate existence. Contrast is antithesis and progressive. In the language of dogmatics, a contrast between the states of humiliation and exaltation. Gaffin pits economic against ontological categories and yet invokes the ontological language of existence. The History of Exegesis, Aquinas, Melanchthon, Cosius, Lang, Bengal, and Forbes all underscored horizontal aspects of Romans 1, 3 to 4. Voss's own explanation of the Son of Man and Son of God pointed to the fact that if pressed, Voss would likely have held both together. Thus, this essay proves that one need not choose between Voss, the systematic versus biblical theologian, as he is both. We are done with that particular article. Finally, we'll be moving on to Bavink, the Beatific Vision, Theological Practice by Michael Allen of Reform Seminary in Orlando. Turn to Concordia Theological Journal and the article on Robert Preuss and David Scare. After Robert was removed from the LCMS Ministerium, he organized the Luther Academy, which would go on to publish the Lutheran Confessional Dogmatics and Logia, a journal of Lutheran theology. Life is filled with as many tragedies as ironies. The Reformation 2006 issue of Logia printed James Nestingen's tribute to Gerhard Ford, along with the funeral sermon for Gerhard Ford, preached by Stephen Olson, Paulson. 
Paulson entitles his introduction to the essential for the collection of his writings, Ford Lives. In 2005, Ford died and has a still growing group of disciples preserving his essays to advance the theology of the cross and adding their own. Yes, Ford lives on. Clement Price published two volumes of his father's collected writings and more may be coming. The time is already here to put the writings of Price side by side with those of Ford and his disciples and to listen to the words of Joshua, choose this day whom you will serve or better. No one can serve two masters, Matthew 6, 24. We finish that in our next article, 57 to 7, 22, Repentance for the Corinthian Community. First Clement's Presentation of Christ in the Old Testament by Daniel Broadus. Turned out a Journal of Theological Society, 1908. The statement of the authorities in this single passage, this is wonkiness, is already enough to create the presumption that both the indeclinable form of Daniel and Ezekiel and those of the second declension are older than the forms of the third declension. Yet owing, I suppose, to the influence of the Vulgate Old Testament, the editors of the Father have hitherto almost with unanimity refused to admit the second declension to the place in the text. Even in the case of most modern editions, it is ordinarily from the apparatus rather than the text that the body of evidence has been amassed. I have no reason to suppose that the forms of the third declension are not original in Augustine or Jerome, but in the eleven authorities that I now proceed to cite, they find singularly scanty support. What a dreary article this is. Um, Protestant Reformed Theological Journal. A book review of the attributes of God and introduction by Gerald Ray. Short studies in systematic theology by Wheaton. Crossway, 2021, page 160 pages, $16, reviewed by Marco Barone. The Attributes of God in Introduction belongs to a series entitled Short Studies in Systematic Theology. The volume consists of a preface, four chapters, and an appendix. The preface briefly introduces the goal of the book, to clarify what the attributes of God are and to present them in a way that can command general consent. Chapter one defines the terms and further describes the goal of the book. Chapter two discusses what Bray calls essential attributes, in turn divided into attributes describing what God is and attributes describing what God is like, attributes contrasted with time, and attributes contrasted with space. Chapter 3 talks about what the author calls God's relational attributes, that is, his communicable attributes. Chapter 4 is a brief explanation of the importance of the doctrine of the attributes of God. The book ends with a historical end appendix titles God's Attributes in Christian Tradition. There are several reasons why I consider this book problematic. We'll pick that up again. We turn now to Thamelios, the lifted up one. This is Johannan Soteriology. The lifted up one. For the evangelist, Jesus came into the world to save sinners. His salvation becomes effective through believing in Jesus or believing in his name, which is the same thing. John's double meanings appear again. 
to believe in Jesus is both believing that he is the word of God, that what he says and claims is true, and also receiving him an existential event. All of this comes about because God loves the world and the world he created, and that still rejects him. He does not give up on it, but sends his unique son to save it. How is this world-saving event brought about? The evangelist analogizes the drama that will unfold of Jesus' crucifixion with that of Moses' lifting up the bronze serpent in the wilderness. John 3, 14, Numbers 21, 8 to 9. In the Moses story, the Israelites wandering through Sinai grumble about their traveling experience in complaining not only against Moses, but against God. They sin against God. God punishes them with a plague of venomous snakes and they, confessing their sin, plead with Moses to intercede with God to remove their punishment. In response, the Lord instructs Moses to erect a bronze snake and place it on a pole so that everyone who leans on it will be healed. The bronze snake in some mystical and ironic fashion brings about their healing. A few footnotes. Contrary to Boltman, the Gospel of John, Jesus' death is being lifted up, 314. Not his departure, ascension, makes the relationship possible. Departure facilitates the coming of the Spirit. Keener notes that ancient Egyptians used images of snakes as magical protection against snake bites, which also cursed the snakes. An icon of deceit, temptation, and death becomes their healer and life giver. Jesus, too, will be raised on a pole so that sinners can believe in him, look on him, and have eternal life be healed at John 3.15. The gospel story does not parallel every element of the Mosaic story, but John draws on the story's healing or life-giving essence. In both dramas, the source of the healing is raised above them. By looking on, believing in Jesus lifted up, one moves from perishing to being given life. We start a new Themelios edition, editorial. This is 2022, a 10-page editorial. The pastor as biblical theologian, Brian Tabb, academic dean and professor of biblical studies at Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minneapolis and general editor of the Melios. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, 27. I've heard many pastors say in the past few years, I never had a class on this in seminary. Pastors and churches have adapted to the ever-changing public health crisis of COVID-19. We've weathered significant political divisions and social unrest, particularly here in the Twin Cities. We've also faced the difficult task of disciplining church members who are constantly formed, constantly formed by social media exposure, who is sufficient for these things. In recent years, there have been calls for local pastors to promote and produce careful theological reflection. See, for example, the work of the Center for Pastor Theologians. This column considers the pastor's vocation as a biblical theologian. My thesis is that a careful Christ-centered biblical theology offers pastors rich resources for teaching and shepherding the people of God in our fraught, fractured, and fearful word. 
I'll begin with some preliminary definitions of pastor in biblical theology. I'll offer a sketch of the pastor as a biblical theologian and conclude with three proposals. Who is a pastor? I recognize that for many Thamelius readers, it may seem rather unnecessary to spend time defining the term pastor, but here we go. By pastor, I mean a spiritually mature man who teaches, oversees, and shepherds a local congregation of believers. The New Testament uses various complementary terms to refer to the same church office. Elders in Acts 14.23, 1 Timothy 5.17, and Titus 1.5. Overseers, Acts 20:28, 20, Philippians 1:1, 1, 1, Timothy 1 Timothy 3, 1 and 2, leaders, Hebrews 13, 7, and pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4, 11. Pastors may be paid church employees or volunteers. They may be called pastors, elders, ministers, or rectors, depending on their church tradition. They may teach regularly or rarely. They may have general ministerial responsibilities in a smaller church or specialized duties in a larger congregation, senior pastor, executive pastor. Regardless, uh, footnote for thoughtful reflections along these lines, see Colin Hansen and Jeff Robinson, 15 things seminary couldn't teach me. Regardless, I understand pastors to be godly, faithful men who are called by a local church to teach God's word and exercise spiritual oversight for the gift of the saints in their care. Their lives reflect the character qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. As Bobby Jamison writes, elders walk in the ways of Christ, strike Christ's people in those ways, and exhort others to follow. We shift now to Journal of Biblical Theological Society and the effort to argue for orthodoxy as the full Catholic Church. The fullness, the Catholicity, is in Christ's presence in the parish and in the individual. If there was but one Orthodox Church left in all the world, cut off from every connection through some massive persecution, then that Church would be as much the Church as the Hagia Sophia at the height of the Eastern Empire the church in Jerusalem has directed other churches, as has the church in Rome. The creed is plain, and so is the teaching of the church. There is only one body of Christ, visible, invisible, and any true schism in that divine body is impossible. Even in the analogy of the church as the bride of Christ, the bride is one. Christ cannot be married to more than one bride. Every Christian keeps in mind that John the Baptist and then John of Nazareth were not what was expected. The Spirit came in a way not expected. Things turned out rationally but exceptionally. The Orthodox at our best know this is true. So we look forward to what will almost surely be remarkable but compatible with ancient truth. This is the offense of the church. We are not what the conservative or the liberal anticipated. We are consistent with the past while being new. The church is visible and one. Popular resources for Orthodox Christians or inquirers agree with almost all mainstream Orthodox theologians and holy teachers. The church is visible and invisible and the church is one. The church is visible and invisible. The faithful can know the church by the spirit. Is this mere subjectivity? By no means. 
We look for signs by looking for a bishop who governs rightly using right doctrine. This is partially subjective. Many of the faithful are too easily fooled by good liturgical practices. There's universal agreement amongst Orthodox thinkers that the church is visible. And this idea is present in scholarly and popular presentations of ecclesiology. A quote here from George Mastrantanus, a new style catechism on the Eastern Orthodox faith for adults. A Lagos mission, 1969. The church is both visible and invisible. The church is the carrier of the divine gifts and divine energies by which mankind is transformed and the kingdom of God is visible. The church as the assemblage of the people who confessed Christ is visible. The visible characteristics of the church are the criteria of the invisible ones. The church is not merely visible as a ghost might be. The church is also subject to other senses and the faithful as living icons, living icons, the sacraments and the liturgy itself. Christ's body, the church is tangible and visible. Visible and the ta tangible is as pure as the church qua church but as a hospital for sinners may appear tainted. Sinners do not taint the holiness of the church. Our mission is exactly this, to extend sanctification to sinners. All men are sinners and no one can say that is without sin. Pick that up in our next edition. Now for Reform Presbyterian Theological Journal and the Presbyterials synod in Ireland for some synodical notes. Dr. Symington and Mr. McLean, the Scottish delegates, addressed the synod. These ads addresses were distinguished by spirituality, pathos, and clear and comprehensive views of public events that affect the interest of religion and the church's duty at the present eventful crisis. The commission, committee to whom were referred the communications from the faculty of the Belfast Institution reported. The Senate appointed a committee to confer with the faculty and also the committees from the Synods of Ulster and the Secession Church respecting the subject of moral philosophy. The plan of education for candidates for the ministry after particular examination was adopted as the interim regulations of Synod on that subject. This plan requires, besides other extensive literary and theological acquirements, a full knowledge of the originals of the sacred scriptures and of the distinctive principles of a covenanted testimony and attaches marked importance to the evidences of practical religion. The Reverend J. Stewart was, at his own request, relieved from an appointment to prepare a document on the elective franchise. Presbyteries were ordered to submit their records hereafter to Synod for inspection and revision. The Synod also recommended that Presbyteries frequently visit the congregations under their care. The committee previously appointed to report respecting the cases of Ballaclare and Liverpool congregations and of W. Russell, Russell student reported utterly disapproving of a candidate for ordination being allowed to offer explanations on the formula at time of ordination. After some discussion, the report was adopted by a large majority. Synod appointed the last Thursday of November to be observed by its members and people under his care as a day of thanksgiving on the last Thursday of January, 1837, as a day of fasting. Pick that up next time as we turn to Southwestern Theological Journal. <clears throat>
and a book review in stone and story early christianity in the roman world by bruce longnecker baker academic 2020 bruce longnecker serves as professor of religion <clears throat> and occupies the melton chair at belt baylor university in waco texas Longnecker has written numerous articles and monographs on the relationship between Pompeii and the New Testament, including Pompeian artifacts and Jesus' devotion, the contours of the issue in the early 21st century, early 2019, early Christianity and Pompeian light, people, texts, situations, 2016. The Crosses of Pompeii, Jesus' Devotion in a Vesuvian Town, 2016. And the Empress, the Goddess, and the Earthquake, Atmospheric Conditions Permitting Public Displays of Jesus' Devotion in Pompeii, 2016. In his writing, Longnecker examines selected archaeological artifacts, graffiti, inscriptions, statues, temples, paintings, tombs preserved by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 to discover what they reveal about the ancient Roman world, especially urban settings. Classical texts are referenced occasionally, but only when they shed light on archaeological remains. Afterward, he relates these artifacts to selected New Testament texts to glean insights into the rise of the Christian faith in its historical setting. Longnecker is particularly interested in identifying the diverse ways Christianity gained a foothold, as well as the fresh ideas it introduced. On the calamity caused by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius affected multiple towns, Longnecker focuses mostly on the artifacts found at Pompeii, to a lesser extent Herculaneum, two coastal towns located about 150 miles south of Rome and adjacent to Naples, it may be added, a little south, south east, but clearly within sight of everybody in Naples. Those unfamiliar with the significance of the resources located at Pompeii and Herculaneum examined by Longnecker may question the legitimacy and uniqueness of his project. Nevertheless, when one recognizes that Pompeii and Herculaneum were covered and preserved by huge amounts of volcanic pumice and pyroclastic ash for centuries up to 20 feet. And by the way, I've had the opportunity to roam around those areas. They come to realize that both locations provide a treasure trove of materials from the ancient world. To be sure, Pompeii it's maybe a 30-minute train ride from the downtown train station of Naples. Pompeii and Herculaneum supply a window to the first century like no other towns from ancient times due to the carefully preserved materials which archaeologists have largely uncovered in the past several hundred years goes to know we're reading an article that indicated archaeology began in the 19th century which was a bit of a laugh we turn now to princeton theological review of 1838 an article that is surveying philip melanchthon his letters his hiring at wittenberg and his transition from humanism to a more vigorous theologizing position. This letter, which was published at the time, drew forth a reply from Eck, in which Melanchthon is described as a grammarian of Wittenberg named Philip, 
not unlearned in the Greek and Latin languages. In another place, he says, the impudent little fellow, Audaculus, does not hesitate to say that I made an irrelevant quotation from St. Bernard. When the debate is published, it will be seen whether the grammarian has told the truth, close quote. The wit of this performance seems to lie in the contemptuous application of epithets, grammaticus, grammatista, grammatellus. The zeal with which Melanchthon now began to enter into the conflicts of the Reformation peeps forth in such sentences as this from a letter that he sent to Spalatin, July 29, 1519. Herewith you will receive Martin Luther's Book of Resolutions on the power of the Pope. You will think it too severe. I think it's not at all imprudent. Close quote. In the same letter, there's a paragraph which we shall quote because the rise of Hebrew learning in that day is highly interesting from its natural connection with the great work of biblical translation. Our Hebraist, says Melanchthon, is unwilling to lecture. He is frightened, I believe, at the difficulties of the Psalter, which I began to teach a year ago. There are men enough able to teach Hebrew grammar. I know not at all why they are afraid of the Hebrew. I'm waiting for this here to populate. Continuing with the letter, if it is thought best that I should in the meantime continue to Hebraize, I will cheerfully bestow this labor on our illustrious prince and on you, my dear George. I will leave no stone unturned to supply the deficiencies of your instruction. Close quote. The growth of his personal attachment to Luther, it is also highly agreeable to trace on account of its influence upon his own belief and character. At the date last quoted, this attachment had become extremely strong, and from time to time it finds expression in such terms as this. For Martin's pious labors and for Martin himself, I feel the most vehement affection and entire regard. Martin sends his salutations. He, he is a friend indeed, ex animo kai chrisanos, of you and of all good men. Sends that to Eck. While well, we turn our attention to William Whitaker, professor of theology at Whit Cambridge in the 1580s and 90s, and his volume disputations on Holy Scripture. We're reading the beginning, prefatory introduction. I have only to add that in translation, I have endeavored to be as literal as one could with a due regard to English idiom. Had I considered myself at liberty to use more freedom, I should have made my task more easy to myself and the work perhaps less tedious to the reader. For there is a prolixity in Whitaker's style, which contrasts unfavorably with the compactness of his great antagonist, Cardinal Bellarmin. Though he trespasses far less upon the station, student's patience than Stapleton, whose verbose rhetoric made him admired in his own day, and whose subtlety of logic cannot save him from neglect in our own day. It is proper to appraise the reader that besides the controversy translated in the present volume, the only one published in the author's time, three others are contained in the ponderous volumes of his works, all of which were published after his death by John Allenson, fellow of St. John's College, Cambridge. The subjects are these, De Ecclesia, 
De Conciliis and De Romano Pontificae. He encountered Cardinal Bellarmine on other controversies in succession. De Ministris et Presbyteris Ecclesiae <coughs> concerning presbyters and ministers of the church. De Sanctis Mortuis, De Ecclesia Triumphantae, De Sacramentis in Genere, De Baptismo et De Eucharistia. The following is a list of his works, and they're all in Latin, and we are down to about 11. A complete collection of his works in Latin was printed in two volumes at Geneva in 1610. Besides the above, Whitaker published a 1569, a Greek translation of the Book of Common Prayer. In 1573, he translated Noel's larger catechism and in 1575, the smaller catechism. And so thus ends the prefatory introduction to this volume. And we will move to the epistle dedicatory by Dr. Whitaker to Sir William Cecil, that famed coadjutant to Queen Elizabeth. We turn now to Bishop John Jewell's apology for the Church of England. We're in a preliminary discourse to that and a lead up before we get into the great work. The complete exposition of the doctrine and discipline of the Protestant established church contained in the Apostle Apology of Bishop Jewell offers such a full and perfect reply to the work of Mr. Butler that any further attempt to throw light on the subject of these differences which have existed and ever must exist between Protestantism and Popery, may in the first instance appear a work of supererogation. But when we find this incontrovertible work has existed for so many ages, and that although in our country the superstitions of Popery have manifestly decayed, Still, the exertions and attacks of individuals have by no means been relaxed. This is written in 1825 as Rome, Roman power was creeping into English political ecclesiastical government and there were fears in England. When we perceive that at this very hour the Romish church is endeavoring to aid their cause, not by arguments founded on justice and reason, but by secular means of pecuniary resources. When this is the case, a few farther observations cannot be in any respect irrelevant. The popish writers who have most violently exclaimed against the injustice of Protestants in attributing to papists that profession of faith, which in reality they do not hold, have invariably appealed to the proceedings of the Council of Trent and the articles of belief there laid down by Pope Pius IV as the standard of their faith. We shall therefore in the present instance offer to our readers a few remarks on that celebrated creed a copy of which is here inserted from Mr. Book, Butler's book of the Roman Catholic Church. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. This is the Nicene Creed. Light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial to the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. 
was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate, suffered and was buried, and rose again the third day according to scriptures, and ascended into heaven, sits at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead, of whose kingdom there will be no end. And in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver, giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who together with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, the one holy Catholic apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the remission of sins, and I expect the resurrection of the dead, the body, and the life of the world to come. And then another quote, I most firmly admit and embrace the apostolical and ecclesiastical traditions and all other constitutions and observations of the same church. Uh, tradition equals scripture. I also admit that the sacred scriptures, according to the sense which the Holy Mother has held and does hold, to whom it belongs, to judge the true sense and interpretation of Holy Scriptures, nor will I ever undertake or interpret them otherwise than according to the common and unanimous consent of the fathers. Another quote from this apparent Roman author, I profess also that there are truly and properly seven sacraments of the new law instituted by Jesus Christ our Lord and for the salvation of mankind, though all are not necessary for everyone, namely baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, order, and matrimony, and that they confer grace. And of these, baptism, confirmation, and order cannot be reiterated without sacrament sacrilege another quote i also receive and admit the ceremonies of the catholic church received and approved in the solemn administration of all the above sacraments this is all a lead up to uh dr whitaker's i'm sorry bishop jewel's um, apology for the church of england I receive and embrace all and every one of the things that have been defined and declared in the Holy Council of Trent concerning original sin, where you're wounded, not dead, and justification where you get the beginning and the installment plan. We'll pick this up again as we continue our work. We now make a beginning in this final series on the Anti-Nicene Fathers, the Apostolic Fathers with Justin Martyr. The editor of this volume was Philip Schaff. It was originally printed in 1885, and it's a 10-volume series on the Fathers before the Nicene Creed. And it brings together Christian thinkers. In particular, it brings forward the writings of the early Church Fathers prior to the Nicene Council. These volumes are noteworthy for their inclusion of the entire texts and not simply fragments or excerpts of these great writings. The translations are fairly literal, providing readers and scholars with a good approximation of the originals. This particular volume includes St. Clement of Rome, Mathetes, St. Polycarp, St. Ignatius, St. Barnabas, St. Papias, St. Justin Martyr, and St. Irenaeus. These writings were heavily influential on the early church and for good reason, as they are inspirational and encouraging. These volumes also come with useful notes providing the reader new levels of understanding. Overall, Anti-Nicene Fathers, or any part of it, is a welcome addition to one's reading list. We will pick this up in our next edition. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end.